I have made plenty of videos about Fallout 2, fact videos, theories, and even other video essays. While Fallout New Vegas has effectively taken the spot of my favorite Fallout game, before that, it was Fallout 2. I know that there are a bunch of irrelevant pop culture jokes, talking death claws, ghosts, and multiple fourth wall breaks, but it still remained in a deep place in my heart. In the late 90s and early 2000s, every time I felt a little down, like a rough day at school, parents having trouble, drama with my friends, and even breakups with girls, I would always fire up Fallout 2, kick on the save editor, max my character out, and just adventure around the wasteland. Now, as an adult, I have made a job covering the games that I love, with a huge emphasis on the Fallout series. With such a wide variety of games to experience these days, it's easy to get lost in new worlds and sink yourself into the universe these stories have brought you to. Regardless, when I feel down, I look at Fallout 2 and end up starting a new run. I lost my mother recently, and it's been a confusing and sobering time for me. So in this video, I am writing a love letter to Fallout 2. Before we start the newest Fallout 2 run, I want to go over what the game means to me, explain a bit of my history with it, and express my love, as the title would suggest, for Fallout 2. There is something about the classic Fallout games that just speaks to me and always has. Granted, when they were released, they were not nearly as hard to get into as they are now. The now archaic UI was still a bit dated by Fallout 2, but for computer RPGs, it worked just fine. Before we start with all that though, I want to shout out the channel's sponsor, Pins by Charlie. Pins by Charlie sells top-notch enamel pins, and with their sponsorship of my channel, Pins by Charlie has started offering Fallout-related designs, including a grab bag of Kim's, the Welcome to New Vegas sign, and both Nuka-Cola and Nuka-Cola Quantum bottles. Use the pinsbycharlie.com link in the description or the pinned comment below and use the code MANTIS at checkout and you will receive 35% off your order. Help support the channel and Pins by Charlie and grab one today. Fallout 2 was the first Fallout game I ever saw with my own eyes. I lived in Shoreline, Washington, and across the street from me was the first friend I made when I moved to the area from Spokane right before my fourth grade year of elementary school. One day I was at his house playing video games or something, and when we came downstairs, his older brother, who I thought was incredibly cool at the time, was with his friend, and they were playing Fallout 2 on the family PC. It could have been the cooler older kids showing such interest in this game that drew me closer, but I had never seen anything like Fallout before, and it instantly connected with me. Much like many of you, the thought of total nuclear devastation completely terrifies me. It's a reality that I hope we never see as a species, and I can't imagine the absolute horror of a full-on atomic war. But that is what pulled me into the Fallout series so hard. The Great War is a possibility, and my fear of something like that happening in real life has only added to my interest in the post-apocalyptic scene. Something about that setting, specifically when Fallout does it, really connects with me. Mad Max has always been a fan favorite, and rightfully so. Even the newest game featuring that universe is incredibly good and sets a good pace for the genre. Still, nothing beats Fallout for me. No matter how many different types of post-apocalyptic games I play, Mad Max, Rage, Metro, Stalker, and even titles arguably on the fringe of the genre like The Outer Worlds, Bioshock, and Borderlands, nothing ever comes close to how I feel when I experience Fallout. It may be because I was introduced to it at such a young age. Whatever the case, it launched an obsession that would carry into my adult years. One of my favorite memories that I've shared on the channel before is going to a swap meet with my childhood friend Daniel. A swap meet is pretty much a flea market. A bunch of people bring their own stuff and have a yard sale of sorts out of their tents and campers, and this one was in the deserts of eastern Washington, likely around the Tenasket area. We gathered bottle caps and various trinkets and pretended we were in the Fallout universe, even running in a zigzag patterns as the characters in Fallout and Fallout 2 would do because of the hexagon system the maps are made from. It was a super fun day that stays in my memories and likely will for my whole life. Still, that only scratches the surface of how much I loved the Fallout games growing up, 
and seeing Fallout 2 for the first time at my friend's house was undoubtedly the catalyst for this. Eventually, I was able to buy the double disc set of the first two Fallout games for myself, and I would spend hours exploring the world and acting as my character actually lived there. I would find houses and settlements that I liked and return to them often. Outside of this, I would take work from Redding with the caravans and make money, just trying to make a normal life in the wasteland. Often in my childhood, I simply used a character editor to max the chosen one out and do whatever I wanted, one punching enemies and passing any skill check in the game. I had a blast. In fact, that is one of my biggest pieces of advice for people who want to check out the first two Fallout games. Find a save game editor. Some can still be found on No Mutants Allowed. Use it to max your character out with all 10 special and 300 in all skills. With this build, you won't be hassled in combat. You can pass any skill check, take any perk, and still experience the story of Fallout and Fallout 2. This also will not make you invincible, but it does give you a leg up with games that some people find really hard to get into. After doing this, playing runs with real builds becomes more manageable. You can find the skills you like to utilize with the maxed out build, apply your points to those, and test your metal in the wasteland with a more vulnerable character. The stories of the first two Fallout games are vital to me, and I feel like all Fallout fans should experience them, so never think less of yourself if you need to take a bit of help from a save game editor when you're learning the games. They can be incredibly brutal, especially if you are not used to late 90s CRPGs. Just because I spent so much time with the first two Fallout games doesn't mean I'm some pro player at them either. I can't speedrun them very efficiently, not that I can speedrun anything. I'm familiar with the game mechanics, but I still die often and make poor decisions in combat. I just really enjoy the games. As I mentioned, the Fallout setting became something I absolutely adored, which was why I was so excited when Fallout 3 was announced. I never thought I would see the franchise again, and to know that Bethesda was working on the third installment in their style brought me a lot of joy. Fallout 2, however, has always had a special place in my heart. Playing through the first game got me hooked on the universe, and the sequel felt like an expansion on what was already offered in the original. Though there are some off-putting things about Fallout 2 that, with time, only seem to get worse. One of the most significant problems I have with Fallout 2 is its twist on humor for the series. The game often references people and events that were perhaps funny in that context, but not so much nearly 30 years later. To be honest, most of these gags were stale by the time Fallout 2 had its 10th anniversary. A big example of this is the Scientology-inspired Habologists. Though one could argue this group would exist in the post-apocalypse due to its notoriety in the real world, Fallout 2 really goes on the nose with its parody, which includes NPCs representing Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, of course renamed to Juan Cruz and Vicky Goldman, respectfully. Some people picking up the game today may not even catch these references. Of course, the Hubologists study Hubology, and this is named after Lafayette Ronald Hubbard, or Elrond for short, the American author who founded the real-life Church of Scientology. So this reference may not be lost to time, and it isn't out of the realm of reality to think that this group would exist. However, when you take into consideration that the Fallout formula should be taking retrofuturism into account, and this universe is supposed to be how people in the 1950s would imagine the year 2241 if it were plunged into nuclear fire in 2077, it starts to feel a bit silly and pandering. Another instance of this type of thing takes place on the Enclave oil rig when we are in the presidential chambers. The first is the vice president, Daniel Byrd. This directly references George H.W. Bush's VP, Dan Quayle, who became the butt of many jokes throughout the early 90s. Just across the way is the president's secretary, who will say various cheeky things about her dress and other activities. She is a reference to the infamous Clinton and Lewinsky scandal, in which then-president Bill Clinton was found to have an affair with a White House intern. Monica Lewinsky could possibly be the most referenced person in pop culture of all time. I like to subscribe to the idea that a joke should be funny within its presented context. When you cram a bunch of super specific references that are time-sensitive topics into your game, you run the risk of later audiences missing the point completely and not understanding why an NPC is so insistent on getting a clean dress. Another type of grievance I have with Fallout 2 is the canonizing of the supernatural. 
we directly interact with a ghost in a side quest in the den. This kind of thing doesn't super bother me, but Fallout already has so much to offer. Adding things like spirits, aliens, and people with superpowers weakens what can be done within the rules of the universe. If you can add whatever you want under the guise of magic and the supernatural, Fallout becomes like every other fantasy RPG. Aliens like the Zetans we see in later Fallout games don't turn me off as much, as I like to believe that there is life outside of Earth, and it adds a fun sci-fi aspect to Fallout when they get involved. The talking death claws of Vault 13 hit this area for me as well. While I like the idea of these creatures mimicking speech like parrots, what we eventually ended up with from that idea is a group of super intelligent death claws that not only negotiate with humans, but maintain immaculate vocabularies. With the root idea of the death claws acting like birds and mimicking human speech, I would have gone with the creatures luring people out with fake calls and then taking their prey when the unexpecting wastelander was investigating it, things of that nature. Death claws are FEV mutants transformed from Jackson's chameleons to super weapons pre war. The idea that these reptiles would somehow shed their increasingly hostile nature and reptilian mindset is absurd, and I would be happy to never see such a thing in the series again. Of course, I liked Goris as a companion. I thought it was a cool addition to get this radical Deathclaw as a follower, but I could do without this whole group, and I feel like returning to Vault 13 could have been a much bigger moment without them, as it kind of seems like creatively, Black Isle shoved the absolute most shocking thing you could see in the Fallout universe in Vault 13, again relying on a more fantasy basis to tell the story. Special encounters are excused from this for me as, most of the time, they are considered non-canon and are put in the game just for fun, though many of these encounters in Fallout 2 suffer from the same problem. They come off more as fun, hidden tidbits to spice up your playthrough and have no real gravity on the story. Unless, of course, you count my favorite, the Guardian of Forever, which when the Chosen One steps through it, takes them to Vault 13 right before the events of the first Fallout game. Once the player interacts with the computer, they effectively break the water chip, setting the first game in motion. While this is outrageous and silly, I see it as a fun callback to the original Fallout and a direct reference to Star Trek, as the same portal appeared in the television series. Regardless, it's a special encounter and, in my opinion, shouldn't be held to the same rules as the rest of the game. This applies to the fourth wall breaking Cafe of Broken Dreams as well, where we can meet a bunch of NPCs spouting facts about the Fallout series, as well as past NPCs from the original Fallout, including Dogmeat, who we can recruit as a companion. These special encounters serve their purpose well, and without them we may not have seen something like the Wild Wasteland trait in Fallout New Vegas. Fallout 2 is why wackiness got added into the Fallout universe, and these crazy scenarios we come across in the wasteland set the tone well. Speaking of setting the tone, the music of Fallout 2 is very evocative to me as well. Mark Morgan, the composer for both games, did an excellent job capturing the tribal nature of the post-war Fallout universe. Each map area has its own song and tone, for the most part, and every single one is hauntingly beautiful. While I'm pretty fond of every song on the classic Fallout soundtracks, my two favorites are Cons of New California and Acolytes of the New God. The driving beat behind the Cons theme has always given me goosebumps. The song fits the tribal setting of Fallout, but still gives off that post-apocalyptic feel. Music like this gives me a good feeling of immersion into the desolate wasteland offered in Fallout 2. Acolytes of the New God was featured more prevalently in the original Fallout and plays when we are on the cathedral map. Something about the church bell ringing mixed with the incredibly dark ambient music has always hit me in a particular way, and this is by far my favorite track from the first game. As I mentioned earlier, the classic Fallout games can be a bit hard to get into. I've heard from many people over the years that can't, for one reason or another, really sink their teeth into the first two games of the series. Whether it's the clunky UI that feels absolutely ancient by today's standards, or the steep difficulty and lack of direction offered in the actual game, players new to the classic Fallout games often feel put off by their experience. 
This is why I mentioned using a save editor, but a walkthrough never hurts either. You can find the nearly ultimate Fallout 2 guide, there is one for the first game as well, with a simple Google search. These guides have been around since I was a teen, and I personally use them myself when learning the game. Speaking of learning the game, we have a run to do, and I'll be doing my favorite build and strategy. This ensures I am good with energy weapons, big guns, lockpick, and speech. Then, when the game begins, I make a mad dash down to San Francisco to get the Verde Plans quest and the location of Navarro so I can get the APA and the pulse rifle. Starting with the Temple of Trials, I got ready to battle with some bothersome ants and scorpions. It's arguable if beating all of the enemies in the temple is worth it or not for the experience, but I usually go through and fight everything. After convincing Cameron that fighting wasn't necessary, it was time to start my journey and become the champion the people of Arroyo deserved. First, before leaving, there are a few quests I like to do around the village to earn some brownie points. After speaking with the Elder, I fixed the village well for Fergus and went to talk to Lucas to get some warrior training. Now it's time to speak to Hakunin and rid his garden of the dickweed plants that have been sprouting up. This can be a tough battle so early in the game, but I was able to smack the plants down a notch. After the fierce confrontation in the garden, we can find Smoke the dog for our cousin. This is an easy 100 experience points, and on our way out of the village, we can become jealous of a fellow tribesman's spear. Grabbing some flint from our cranky ant, we can get the sharpened spear and finally head out on our quest. This is the tricky part of the playthrough. This is where we will navigate the world map down to San Francisco and then to Navarro. This early in the game, a lot of encounters on the southern end of the map will lead to almost instant death, especially the Enclave Patrol, so saving every few map squares is a good idea. On the way down, I stumbled upon the Cafe of Broken Dreams. I recruited Dogmeat to my party, then hit the road and continued our trip to the Golden City. Of course, we ran into some people in the wrong place at the wrong time. This encounter always spoke to me so much as a kid. The sheer size of Frank Horrigan, next to large armored soldiers, is enough to stop me in my tracks. This is by far one of my favorite scenes in a Fallout game. Once we get to San Fran, we can hit up one of the best bugs in the game. Two of the merchants here can be stolen from easily and keep their money open for us to take. The best part of this trick is that when we buy things from these vendors, they will have the money we just used in their inventory meaning we can steal it right back after any purchase, making everything in the shops free. Now we go talk to Matt at the Brotherhood of Steel to get the location of Navarro, as well as the quest to get the Vertibird plans from the base and deliver them back to the Brotherhood. This part of the run is the most harrowing, as we will be going through the area of the Enclave patrols. Any encounter with one of their troops is a death sentence, and unfortunately, they show up quite a bit. This is where saving every other square on the map comes in really handy. This is also where Dogmeat sadly crosses the Rainbow Bridge in this run, falling in combat. Once at Navarro proper, we deal with Chris and head underground to grab the Advanced Power Armor, my favorite design in the series. There are some other things to do here, but they become a little easier once we get some levels under our belt. Though I was able to steal the Vertibird plans by taking off the armor and sneaking. Heading back to San Fran is still a challenge, as the Enclave can and will take us out anytime we encounter them at this stage. However, once we make it back into the city and speak with the Brotherhood, things become a little bit different. The reward can be found in one of the lockers in the Brotherhood base, the YK-42B Pulse Rifle. This weapon doesn't make us unstoppable, but it certainly helps even up the odds, giving us some actual defense as we go to collect the next gun that will make this build complete. I arrived at Klamath several hours later in a daze. With our new gear, none of the quests here will be a challenge. First, we talk to Tor, who needs help guarding the Brahmin. I used this opportunity to dispatch both of the Dutton brothers as they are the ones actually responsible for this, as they have been teasing the tribal by dressing up as scorpion men. Once that was done, I made easy work of the scorpions, and Tor was satisfied with a job well done. Now, we can talk to Whiskey Bob about his still. This is another simple romp out to the gecko fields to refill Bob's whiskey still. Most of the geckos out here are the standard variety, though some are gold. None pose a problem to an APA-clad, pulse-rifle-wielding chosen one, so the task is completed quickly. Back at Buckner's, we can talk to Arden Buckner about Smiley, a missing trapper. This will lead us to the Toxic Caves, which are filled with golden geckos. This, of course, isn't much of a problem, and we can get to Smiley pretty easily. 
After leading Smiley out of the caves, we can return to the site we found him. Before that, I'm going to need to raise my repair skill in order to fix the generator. Returning to Klamath, we can convince the Buckners to forgive Solik's debt because we found Smiley, adding him to the team. Now we can check out Trapper Town and investigate their problems with rats. As expected, the northern part of town is covered in rats and it gets much worse when we go underground. They just keep getting bigger and bigger until we reach the King Rat, who is apparently in charge of the rest of the flock. After dethroning the king, we can head topside to a broken down old highwayman. It's here we can find a fuel injection system that will come in handy down the line. And this is also where I learned that in the newer versions of Fallout 2, due to the pathmaking extension, we can simply click on the main bit of Trapper Town and leave this area instead of going through the caves again. Heading to the south grid of Klamath, we can find the vertebra that Daisy Whitman crashed being guarded by a robot. This is all a part of a cut quest and nothing here is useful, but it's a fun encounter right outside of town. Next, I hit the bathhouse to chat with the local ladies about things in the area and, more importantly, to get the sexpert perk. You earn this by having relations more than 10 times during your journey, and it just seems like a good perk to have, for role-playing reasons of course. Now we just need to stop by Vix and loot his stuff, and it's off to the din. Once there, we have a few things we can do. First up is Becky. We need to get some money back from Fred, a local junkie. After this, she needs help locating a book, The Lavender Flower. This can be found spawned in one of a few places around the din's east side. And once we find it and return it to Becky, we have enough repair skill to try the generator at the Toxic Caves. Now that the generator is fixed, we can use the electric lockpick on the elevator and head down to a mini boss fight. The security bot looks tough, but it's nothing we can't handle at this point. Once the boss is defeated, our reward is the Bozar. This weapon completes our build. Back at the den, we can finish up with the usual quests, helping Lara with the church, taking out the slavers, rescuing Vic, delivering Smitty's meal for mom, and burying the bones for the ghost of Anna Winslow. Smitty has a highwayman that he can get into working order, and that is great news for us since we picked up the fuel injection system. Unfortunately, this part isn't what makes it run, but later on, we can meet a ghoul that will help us out with that. The gang and I traveled to Modok, where we helped Grisham by keeping the wolves away from his Brahmin. Then we chatted up Balthus about his missing son Johnny, before speaking to Joe about the ghost farm up the road. The farm seems to be decorated with dead bodies, but we can take a closer look and see that they are dummies covered in Brahmin innards. Inside a shack, we can fall through the floor and get an audience with Vigor, the leader of this group. It seems they want to work out some kind of deal with Modok, and we can also find Johnny, the son of Balthus, deep in the caves. Returning to town, it would seem they are not too keen on working out an agreement with the people at the farm, as they don't know what happened to Carl, the farmer that lived there. At this time, we make a beeline to Vault City, but the group is accosted on the way there by the Bridge Keeper. This is a great reference to Monty Python, and it also gives us the Bridge Keeper robes, one of my favorite apparel options in Fallout 2. Now that we've hit Vault City, we can do the usual around the outside grounds, finding the Mr. Nixon doll for Curtis, which leads to digging up a wrench behind the bar. After that, we can hear about Joshua, who is being kept inside the city, and we can recruit Cassidy, who happens to be the father of Cass from Fallout New Vegas. The guy Vic got the Vault 13 water flask from is here as well, and we can move into the city pretty quick by talking to the staff here while only wearing our Vault suit. This will grant us an immediate day pass and access to the city. Inside, we meet Val, Vic's daughter, and an in-game cutscene ensues. The two bicker for a while, but we can give Val some tools, and she will reward us with a super toolkit the following day. Heading to the Servant Allocation Center, we can convince them to let Joshua go before we head up to where the city's top officials are. Here we can meet First Citizen Lynette, who is always such a breath of fresh air, and learn that Vault City is having problems with the nearby town of Gecko. It seems their defunct power plant has been leaking into Vault City, and the First Citizen wants it dealt with swiftly. Lynette gets enraged at the mere suggestion of diplomacy, so it's best to save our breath and just head to Gecko. On the way out, we can give some rat away to puking Charlie. This will cure his radiation poisoning and it's just a nice thing to do. We can also visit the Smiths, who have had a hard year and need help getting a plow. A smooth 250 experience points. Resting until the next day will give Val enough time to have the super toolkit ready, and we are now good to go to Gecko. 
This is an excellent town because the mayor is our good friend Harold, though even the tired old mutant thinks Gecko has seen better days. He will tell us that we need a hydroelectric magnetosphere regulator to fix Gecko's power plant. He is pretty sure Vault City has one to spare, but they won't do business with the likes of him, not to mention the rest of the ghouls in town. There is a ghoul up north inside a garage. This is Skeeter, and he is the one that has the part for Smitty's old highwayman. We can trade the super toolkit we got from Val for it, and now we will be able to get the car running, and we can head back to the ghost farm to find out that Carl fled his farm to the den. Once there, we can exchange the part we got from Skeeter to Smitty, and now we are in possession of a genuine highwayman. It would be a shame if an obscure bug took it from us hours later into the run, but that has never happened before, so I don't see any reason to be worried about that. We can find Carl inside Mom's drunk and passing out. After talking to him for a bit, we can get his side of the story. Now that we know that he is alive and well, we can return to Modoc and start working out a deal between the farm and the townspeople. Now, after a series of misunderstandings, the town of Modoc, or Modoc, however you want to say it, and the people of the farm are living together in harmony. Once back in town, we reunite Johnny with his family, and while there are some more things to do in town, I thought it was a good time to take my leave. Now, with the power of the highwayman on my side, I decided it would be an excellent time to restock down in San Francisco. The car makes the trip a breeze, and while we still get some encounters, it's not nearly as bad as walking. On our way, we stumbled into a group of fire geckos. This is a fight I thought we could easily win, but boy was I mistaken. The geckos wasted no time taking out my entire party in just a matter of a few turns. Cassidy, Solik, and Vic all became wasteland set pieces as I drove my way to San Fran. After collecting money and supplies in San Francisco, I set my sights on Vault City again. Harold had said that they had the part needed to fix the Gecko power plant, and after talking to Senior Counselor Member McClure, I was able to obtain a hydroelectric magnetosphere regulator, and I was on my way to Gecko. After I rolled into town, I let Harold know I had the part, and it was off to the power plant to get it installed. I pickpocketed the keys from various guards inside the building, which I find to be the easiest way inside. After going through a few rooms, we reach the man we are looking for, Festus. This rather unkempt ghoul will refuse at first, but after some convincing, he will install the high mag for us, and Gecko's power plant problem will be solved. Returning to Vault City, if we let McClure know what we did, he will make the Chosen One a citizen of Vault City, which gives us access to Vault 8, which lies inside the city walls. Inside the vault, we can check the computer for references for the Gek and Vault 13. Doing so will add the location of Vault 15 to our BitBoy, and we can be on our way, one step closer to saving our village. Arriving at Vault 15, we can mingle with the squatters and agree to help a woman find her missing daughter. The trail leads to a shack outside a vault entrance guarded by two raiders. We can make easy work of them and let the girl out of her holding room. Inside the vault is a little more tricky. Vault 15 is filled with cons, vicious raiders that have intimidated everyone around them to follow their guidance. Their leader, Darian, will put up quite the fight. Still, the Chosen One can fight their way out of this mess, and the computer here will give us the location of the fabled Vault 13, as well as confirm that there's a spy in the NCR. Arriving at Vault 13, we head through the familiar caves and to the big vault door. Upon opening the entryway, we see that the vault is overrun with death claws. These are the death claws that can speak, and some even harbor incredibly high intelligence levels. As I said before, these are not my favorite additions to the Fallout series. However, we can agree to help Gruthar by checking out the computer inside the vault in exchange for a Gek. When inspecting it, we see it needs a replacement voice module. Deathclaw hands are too large to use a computer, so the leaders of the pack rely on voice controls to interact with the mainframe. One could just steal the Gek from the Deathclaws, but I wanted to do my part for the group, though I did snag the Navcom parts, which we will need for later on. I drove back up to Vault 8 in Vault City to grab a new voice module for the computer inside Vault 13, and then it was time to head back. Back at the Deathclaw Clubhouse, I installed the voice module and Gruthar handed over the Gek. When I was leaving the vault though, Hakunen appeared to me telepathically to tell me that the village has died, so I was on my way to Arroyo. Once there, he told me the story of the Enclave coming in and taking all of the villagers into vertebrates and flying over the ocean. 
I mean, he didn't say that. He says some long-winded nonsense about the shadows of darkness and the great basin of our Earth Mother's tears, but he means the Enclave took everybody. Before investigating this further, I decided to go down to San Fran to restock and then hit the BOS bunker to install a memory module. Once I hit the computer, it showed me what had happened to Matt, the guard posted here, and I was on my way to Mariposa. We can find another memory module here, and also Melkor, a mini boss who uses his pets as companions in the battle. This is a tough fight, and I died a few times trying to take out the mutant, but eventually, the Chosen One came out on top, and it was time to leave. I decided to stop by the Raider hangout and clear it while I was in the area. At this stage in the game, this is an easy fight, and it can give us a ton of loot. Since it's a nice source of experience points, I cleared the cave and headed toward Navarro. This time, I was leaving with the key fob for the tanker, whether I had the sneak for it or not, so I had to shoot my way out of the base. This isn't as bad as it sounds, and it's not much of a challenge to do so at our current level. Now on to one of my favorite locations, New Reno. After talking to Jules, I went to the gym to inquire about boxing. It was easy to sign up, and now I was fighting the best New Reno had to offer in the ring every night, eventually working my way up to the Masticator. After my thunderous victory over the champ, it was time to check out the more seedy activities New Reno has to offer. Returning to Virgin Street, I found my car had been stolen, and I asked a nearby youth if he had seen anything. The kid led me to a gas station ran by T-Ray. After some negotiation, I was able to get the highwayman back and continue checking out the hidden underbelly of the biggest little city in the world. First, I checked in with the Mordino family at the Desperado Casino. Little Jesus said I could speak with his father, Mr. Mordino, about some work, and I did. After doing some work for the family, Mordino wanted me to take out Salvatore, another mob boss in the city. After going to meet with him, I took some jobs and gained his trust too. I ended up taking out both men with the super stim pack trick, and this had no discernible effect on the game world as everybody acted like they were both still alive. Mordino did give me access to the stables though, which allowed me to add Myron to the party. Due to the way I fumbled through the quests, I wasn't able to get the location of the Sierra Army Depot, as the rights were instantly hostile to me. So, it was time for me to hit the old dusty trail, and I set my sights on the NCR capital. I already had a majority of the quests for this area done. My only real goal here was to check in with the leadership and get some easy experience points. So after exposing the spy in the NCR's upper echelon, I chatted with Tandy, turned in the chips she wanted, and I was on my way to Broken Hills. The first thing I did here was lose an arm wrestling match to Francis. This has unfortunate consequences. After an exciting night, I decided to fix the mine's air filter. Little did I know, this sealed my fate in an unexpected way. When traveling down into the mine, a bug was triggered that caused my highwayman to disappear from the map. I am not sure if it spawns somewhere random or not, but I would never find it again. So, finishing up the quest here, we recruited Marcus and it was off to the tanker in the San Francisco Bay. Getting this thing to working order seems like a colossal task, but it's not as bad with everything that we have collected along the way. We need fuel, and the she here in San Fran can hook us up. So after chatting with them, they enlisted my help to take out the Hobologist leader. After doing so, I could interface with the Emperor, which happens to be an advanced computer. We need to install the Navcom parts on the tanker as well, which leads to a dangerous fight in the ship's lower decks. Floaters, Wanamingos, and Centaurs galore down here, and they came to party. After getting these things done, we can head to the captain's area and using the fob we got from Navarro, be on our way to the oil rig, the Enclave's main headquarters. This is where the story ends. We have made it to the oil rig, and the only way out of here is blowing the place sky high. We can grab a set of APA Mark II in the lockers next to the maze, and after that, it's time to cause some chaos. We can speak to Dr. Curling, and he will release his FEV variant into the air of the oil rig, though no named NPCs will be killed from doing this. He inoculates the player and the villagers before doing so. This removes quite a bit of the riffraff from the area and allows us to proceed with our mission. We can use the super stim pack trick to take out the president, as his access card will come in pretty handy in just a bit. The final blow to the oil rig is done when we blast the computers in the area, setting the whole base to a 10 minute self-destruct sequence. We find a squad of Enclave troops on our way that warns us that Frank Horrigan just came through and he was pretty upset. 
We can convince them to join us, and using the access card we got from Richardson, we can use the turrets to help take down Frank. With the help of the guns and the troopers, this fight is pretty easy to get through. One thing you may not know is that if you set the violence level to minimum or none, Horrigan will die in a static pose, as the game can't play his animation under these circumstances. However, this leads to an interesting bug that allows the Chosen One to loot Frank's weapons, which cannot be done under normal conditions. All we have to do is get another character over the same hex that Horgan is on, we can then switch loot windows, and the inventory for the Enclave's secret weapon will be revealed. While this is cool and all, the Bozar pulse rifle setup that we have is far more effective in combat. The end boss weapons appear as pink squares with text descriptions in our inventory, and it's a neat little bug that some players may have missed when playing through Fallout 2. This is where Fallout 2's main story ends. The oil rig is blown sky high, and the Chosen One rides off in the distance back to the mainland. We get ending slides based on what we did throughout our time in the wasteland, and then the game asks if we would like to continue playing. If we do so, we can return to the oil rig even though it has been destroyed. This grants a huge amount of experience points and can be used to level up a bit, just don't be on the map when the self-destruct time hits zero. This may seem useless as we can just use the Fallout 2 hint book that Father Tully gives the Chosen One in New Reno once the game is complete. However, using this book boosts all skills to 300%, so for those of you that may want to keep the game more balanced but still gain a couple of levels, this is a viable speedup. After playing through Fallout 2 again, I felt a little better, as I always did when I would escape to these games during rough times. Did anything change? No, my mom was still gone, but for a moment, when wandering through the wasteland, seeing old friends and visiting the places I grew up in, virtually of course, it set my feelings at ease. To me, the classic Fallout games are just that. They aren't just games, bits of data thrown onto a screen mixed with pretty colors. They're home. I spent so much time playing Fallout and Fallout 2 growing up that experiencing them again is like going back to where I'm from. All of the memories of all the other times that I played the games come flooding back, and going through each part of the game is like visiting your old stomping grounds 20 years later, but nothing has changed. Maybe that's why I like it so much. It never changes. No matter how many things in life transform, the video game will remain constant. It's static. It will be the exact same every time you choose to turn it on, and there isn't much in the real world that does that. We go back to our hometowns, new buildings surround us while the ones we remember have vanished. The people we once knew no longer live there, and even if they did, so much has changed through time that you wouldn't even have anything to talk about if you did see them. But Fallout 2? It stayed the same. Arroyo needs the Gek. It's in Vault 13. The Chosen One takes the tanker to the oil rig for one of the biggest fireworks displays in the past century, roll credits. The experience we had along the way can change, but the comfort of the wasteland remains. I like that. I have made plenty of videos about Fallout 2, fact videos, theories, and even other video essays. But this one is special. I needed it. Thank you, Fallout 2. My love for this series started with you, and I will never forget it.